So wonderful to see you all and to share a little bit about uh, the exhibits. I thought I'd just focus on the Dulit arts mostly, but give some kind of context to the other arts as well. And a sense of um, what, where Mithla is on the map of India, and it is roughly 44,000 uh, square miles, which is about the size of Pennsylvania. And uh, as you can see, it's in the north, somewhat northeast of India. And it also, the traditional region of Mithla, which was in ancient times a kingdom, includes areas of Nepal, southern Nepal. Mm. And it's at the, mostly at the foothills and the plains of uh, the uh, south of the Himalaya. And... The Himalayas are the youngest mountain range in the world and also, therefore, one of the most active and lots of earthquakes. Now, I'm mentioning all of this for a reason that will become apparent. Um, the, uh, you know, high mountains bring, of course, many rivers and there are issues about flooding and also that's the negative or positive way if the floods are in a certain magnitude, um, but also uh, the, um, the uh, let me see where we are now. I'm going to switch to this next scene. Because there are about six rivers that go through the area and it's very fertile uh, in many ways. So there are positive aspects to nature, but between the flooding and the earthquakes, there are many other uh, dangerous ongoing issues. I, I could mention, for example, I'm going to quote here uh, a Government of India report. Quote, Bihar is India's most flood-prone state. And, it, and when I say Bihar, the uh, Mithla sections of, of um, India are when the northern section of Bihar, the state of Bihar. So Bihar is the India's most flood-prone state and is under constant threat of flooding. Every year, floods destroy lives, livestock, infrastructure, and bring huge financial toll. 76% of the residents in the northern regions are vulnerable to recurring floods. Now, that report was written about six years ago, um, and now, more recently, in the Mongaba Bay Nature Journal, um, which is a leading uh, nature journal in India. Uh, uh, it uh, appears, quote, climate change is making extreme climate events more frequent in the state, along with higher incidence of landslides, flash floods, and drought. Um, so this is, these are only generalizations. Of course, there are lots of statistics can, that do back all that up. Um, but I want to get back to the earthquakes. We'll return to the floods in due course. Um, in 1934, a major earthquake hit the area. Uh, I think it was 10,000 people. Yeah, 10,000 people died, approximately. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi came to offer um, condolences and support. Um, and this was a great tragedy, the first of a sequence of tragedies that also brought with them surprising developments that affected the culture and arts of Bihar. Because what we see here is a devastation of buildings um, in one of the towns, but in, throughout the villages too, uh, all of a sudden walls were, had fallen down that had for uh, at least a century and a half had been firmly there and obscuring what was inside and what was inside and why it was obscured. Um, the caste status of uh, most of these householders was upper caste um, and they would have ritual wall paintings in their homes, especially in their wedding chambers. Um, and nobody from the outside world had ever seen these before because we who were Westerners and English um, administrators and whatnot simply were not allowed inside homes because of caste restriction. Um, and we're considered maleksh, and 
they did business with us and whatnot, but it was a rather formal relationship. The walls came down. A British magistrate um, by the name of William Archers, who had studied history and humanities at Cambridge, um, was in charge of surveying the damage and he had a, quite a background in art and was uh, uh, very savvy about then contemporary arts. And what he saw around there amazed him. He took these photographs um, after the uh, earthquake uh, and was just astonished by these elaborate murals inside these homes uh, throughout the region. Uh, and he likened them in his mind, some of them to Picasso, Miro, uh, Paul Clay, artists who were modernists that he was familiar with. And um, this, uh, I might add, this particular one um, was the first time anyone had identified one of these artists who had done the actual mural because in his transcriptions, he only put the male household uh, <laughs> Uh, a householder is named down and made no note of who the artists were. And one of the artists who is indeed uh, contemporary artists, our contemporary artists, who has work exhibited both here at Floyd Center for the Arts and at Radford's Tyler Gallery. She, um, I was going through this uh, material with her to discuss it and by gosh she recognized this was by her grandmother. And it was the first time in Indian art history that these uh, seemingly anonymous, you know, artists had been identified. So we have that now. And she is also a teacher of art in, in Madhubani. So uh, that was kind of an exciting breakthrough. But these various wonderful depictions with figures that look uh, two-dimensional, uh, deities are often shown um, uh, kind of in a suspended uh, animation and uh, uh, but uh, take note these terms that I say Kayast and in Brahman these are all upper caste artists so William Archer really didn't photograph um, too many of the any of the um, he, he identified but did not photograph any of the Dalit art on the walls and he just it may have been a matter of taste, we're not quite sure. But essentially, these it's quite a mishmash, and people who want to say that these ritual arts were very separate from uh, more secular depictions of everyday life, they have to deal with a picture like this, which shows avatars of the god Vishnu below, and then a train with a ticket collector up above. So, um, these these murals are full of surprises and they're delightful, but um, they beg the question to what were the other folks doing? Um, now, I want to fast forward a bit to another tragedy. After the earthquake happening in 34, came a devastating drought in 1966. And um, what happened then was that the uh, Prime Minister of India, at the time it was Indira Gandhi, she got in touch with her chief minister of culture, Pupul Jaikar, and asked what can we do to revitalize this area which was known for its arts and crafts in various ways, ceramics, ba uh, weaving of textiles, baskets, you name it. But they had all knew at that time because Archer had published these photographs that you'd earlier seen in a prominent art journal called Marg, they knew that these mural traditions were going on. And so the idea was to send an art student, and the art student chosen is this gentleman, Bhaskar Kukarni, who was a bit of a hippie at the time, um, to this very conservative area of India to promote the idea of transferring the imagery that was on the murals onto paper. And so this uh, is what he did. And what we have here is a depiction. This picture is on display at Radford, uh, at the Covington Gallery's Raja Selesh's Garden exhibition. And it shows Bhaskar Kukarni in a cycle rickshaw. Um, and uh, he's arriving at a town, 
a little village of Jitwarpur where many of the artists are living and you can see the ladies painting murals on the wall well they're about to paint on on paper and what a life-changing uh, a real game changer that will be uh, here's a lovely quote to indicate the and uh, how significant that was I've seen years of struggle when we painted on cow dung smeared walls and hours of our work washed out by rain but we didn't think there was any option then came paper it changed our lives what more can you ask for so this is a a wonderful kind of testament for the introduction that uh, uh, of outsiders it's it transferred the art from a ritual art into a commercial art but uh, the artists themselves were still doing the same imagery and with much gusto and getting be uh, uh, wonderful rewards for it indeed they were so well received and it was proved to be so popular that they were getting nationwide exposure and then international exposure with exhibitions such as with the art on the right, for example. Uh, Bawa Devi, she was given a major uh, a gallery to display in at uh, the Pompidou Center in Paris in 1986 for her work um, in a big exhibit called uh, uh, Magicians of the Earth. Uh, and so this is typical of the upper caste uh, Brahmin style, which is more color, multicolored, and um, uh, focusing on deities. Um, and this is how that community worked. And then this is an example of the Kayast uh, caste work. And the Kayasts are, tr by tradition, scribes and accountants. Um, and not only for, when I say by traditions, starting with the Mughals and right up through the British. And it was from the British that they got red and black ink for keeping account books. And so they decided this is what they're going to use to, as their kind of um, signature style for their community. And uh, they can, did it very well. So this, these these, uh, the picture on the left, for example, is now on display at Radford. Um, the artist who did that picture has also done two pictures um, in the main gallery of a, a gentleman fighting a, a rainstorm with an umbrella, contemporary theme. And he's also depicted uh, Krishna uh, subduing Kaliya, which is considered the oldest environmental myth um, in, the, known. So um, maybe we can check that out with Bill if that's indeed the case, but that's what is often said. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. This is a schematic simply to indicate the hierarchy uh, of um, the Varna system where you've got a pyramid above with the four categories with the Brahmins, priests at the top, and you can see for yourself the different categories in the blue area um, that are very distinct. You don't intermarry and you don't really uh, f uh, fraternize or even break bread with people outside of your category. Then that whole pyramid is kind of suspended over uh, another whole category of uh, people who are not considered fully human, frankly. Um, the Adivasis, the tribals, and the Dalits, uh, who were originally called Achut, which meant untouchable, and that went on for a millennia and um, in a bid for social uplift uh, Mahatma Gandhi decided to call them um, Harijans which means people of God uh, pardon me, children of God and in more recent times the more progressive members of their community have taken umbrage at being called children of, uh, and wanted to have another term and so they chose uh, this term Dalit uh, which means crushed or broken, and uh, it's a kind of a term of defiance. It's a Sanskrit term. Um, it's like taking a negative and making it into a defiant, as, say, for instance, the queer community in nowadays does in, here in the U.S. So how did they get this lowly status? Well, Hinduism is a religion that puts, uh, like many other traditions, high premium on concepts of purity, but even more so, uh, they insist on purity of 
uh, that is not just spiritual but material. And so if those people who are engaged with professions that are in, passed on from generation and uh, uh, assigned to them from birth, uh, such as sweeping the roads, uh, t- tanning leather, um, also uh, dealing with uh, animal carcasses um, and human corpses, all of this is highly polluting. And so um, this has, in a way, uh, affected their very low un- status, e- untouchability, and the very term itself has been abolished um, in India. If you use it there, you use it in air quotes or real quotes, um, as you should, but of course there are people who will abuse terms like that as people in the U.S. will use abuse the N-word uh, here. Um, so uh, this is, um, there are um, Dalit communities in every village. And uh, I'm going to give you a sense of this little village that I'm most familiar with, of Jitwarpur, um, which I feel very fondly about. And I'm going to focus not on the upper caste murals uh, that are done indoors for the marriage uh, chambers, but actually for the exteriors. Then this is more of what the Dalits have done, which are these rather bold, jazzy um, uh, designs, sometimes done with a kind of chalk and uh, um, uh, muds of different sorts. The artist, Ormala Davy, who's shown at left, uh, she is one of the artists who's celebrated in this exhibit as well as in the other two exhibits at Radford. Um, Certain of the motifs um, that you see here, um, this flower motif here with volutes at the bottom and birds, if you can see that it's kind of obscured there by the um, uh, the uh, kerosene lantern, but um, uh, these are motifs that will keep cropping up and um, Part of the fun of all this is that little of this has been, at least fun for me, little of this has been documented. So trying to trace down themes and motifs of various sorts uh, becomes an exciting challenge. Uh, This is a more elaborate mural. Um, And I show you this because, you know, here we have uh, a a typical wattle and daub architecture, which is like done in the southwest of of America, Uh, clay mixed with cow dung to give it viscosity and uh, it has a a wonderful kind of biomorphic uh, uh, quality to it. There are no straight lines. The whole thing uh, has a a wonderful warmth to it. Well, that natural warmth is something that the um, one of the artists decided she wanted to to captivate, uh, capture again in the art itself. Now, all of us know, those of us who are either writers or artists know what it's like to look at a blank piece of paper. It glares back at you. It can be kind of intimidating. So this is her way of making a kind of sp- a friendly, uh, natural tone, uh, earthy look to the painting. And this picture is, as you might have noticed, in the exhibit here at uh, um, uh, the Floyd Center for the Arts. Also, it may not seem terribly radical to look at a picture titled um, uh, Women Doing Household Chores. But the amazing thing is that this is a kind of uh, radical departure because in Indian art, you just don't depict that kind of thing. You pick deities, you pick auspicious symbols and whatnot. Household chores were one of this particular artist's favorite themes, and she returned to it often in her life, and not always in muted colors, sometimes in outrageous colors. Um, But that's something that is part of the charm, I find, of the Dalit arts, is that they are very uh, down to earth. Now this is um, a detail of a mural, and I just simply include it to show that often the lines are um, double lines with a polka dot or dotting motifs inside that kind of give it a staccato and sparkly look. Um, And you can see that on larger paintings, again, kind of 
serving as ersatz murals, if you will, even on paper. Um, so this, ex this particular work is at Radford University Art Museum's um, Raja Selesh's Garden Exhibition. And it shows Raja Selesh in the center riding his signature elephant, uh, and accompanied by his two brothers and the Malins, the flower maidens, who are uh, always part of his entourage. More about them in a moment, I'm sure. Uh, another source of the arts is not just the uh, murals, but tattoo patterns. And so this is a work that's at Radford. Uh, there are other works here at Floyd that show these patterns and motifs. Uh, this has almost the delicacy, I think, of a Paul Clay. Um, and uh, these, you hear again, you see the actual um, tattoo on an arm at the top center, and then how these volutes and motifs of uh, the birds flanking the, the plants are played out below. And this is the artist herself, Ormila Davy. We had hoped to bring her here to Virginia, both to help uh, celebrate what's happening here at Floyd Center for the Arts and at Radford, and it just didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, and uh, this is her granddaughter. And uh, she, too, is quite a talented young lady. This photograph was taken of her when she was 14 years old, and the picture of hers, I'm going to show you a detail of it next. Um, and those of you who've been to Radford, you can see this, these themes of trees, fish, and uh, peacocks. These are very auspicious. You see, you get them all interlocked. This is, there's the head of the peacock, and these are the wings, and it's a kind of puzzle picture. Um, and it's really quite remarkable that a 14-year-old girl could make such an ingenious image. I'm sorry the resolution isn't very sharp in this slide, but I encourage you to see the original in, um, at Radford. Now this was done by her father, um, and it shows the Earth Mother uh, emerging out of the tor world turrets and manifest in many levels and with many arms, as you see. Um, what's particularly interesting to me at this point are these details. Um, this is a shrine that's a Hindu shrine with the trident at the top, the lingam, um, the phall stone phallus that is worshipped, and the bell. And this, if you look closely at the top, has a crescent moon indicating that it is um, a mosque. And so this painting was done at the time that um, Narendra Modi, the pri current prime minister, was being swept into high office. Um, and a lot of uh, concurrent strife between the Muslim and uh, Hindu communities was coming to the fore. And so to have a Dalit artist showing a vision of the creation at the time, uh, at the original times with the two communities living in harmony was quite uh, a radical and, and beautiful thing in many of our eyes. Uh, he also did, um, it, it also in strange ways he would not know of, but art historians have noted that a piece like this, his on the right of course, uh, relates very closely to ancient Hindu iconography um, with the work on the left where you have many tiers of Shiva all kind of emanating out in this theme of emanation and the aesthetics of replication, almost like um, uh, holograms or fractals, if you will. Uh, this is uh, a theme that goes throughout Hindu sculpture as well as architecture. The temples work very much on that principle. Um, but our Dalit artists will take some liberties. Shravan here has depicted at the tips of each of those arms there, heads of animals. And um, this has never, ever been done before in all of Indian art history. And so they're not above taking, being very inventive in their own way. Um, this is an example that I very much appreciate, and I shared it just this afternoon with a couple of friends here. And uh, it kind of shows how, um, 
These arts may superficially look like uh, Hindu images, but um, actually aren't. Uh, some of you have gone to Angkor Wat and have seen the great bas reliefs there that depict a theme called Samudra Montan, the churning of the ocean. Um, huge, it's the centerpiece of the main temple, and basically at the time of creation, uh, the deities um, were, uh, and the demons and the deities took a great cosmic serpent and wrapped it around the cosmic mountain at the center of the universe that was on the back of a great turtle and the turtle was in the great oceans and they churned, it was like a tug of war, they churned the uh, whole system that they had created there and out of the mountain came Amrita, the elixir of immortality and many other extraordinary blessings. Uh, so, uh, this is what seems to be depicted here. Most people would see immediately the turtle, the head of the turtle, the arms, this whole back is the shell, uh, various Hindu deities that are iconic. This is uh, uh, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, the, uh, Saraswati, the goddess of wisdom and the arts, Brahma, uh, Shiva, and who is this character who I show up there in the upper left? Well, that is Raja Selesh. And what's he doing? He's playing the drum. Um, and not only is he playing the drum, but he makes the whole world dance to his own drum beat. And he makes Lakshmi dance, the goddess of wealth. She's shown here lifting her skirts. So she's shown twice there in the hierarchy term, there in dancing. Um, and uh, so here we have a kind of gentle subversion these Dalit communities uh, and their hero deity, or Selesh, I mean, they've been oppressed for a long time and he is their champion. And essentially, they, they are subverting a classic Hindu creation myth saying that, look, we're in charge and you're all dancing to our drumbeat in a way. Um, there are other themes of climbing of, um, that are tied to nature. And I'm very fond of depictions of toddy palm harvesting here in the 19th century uh, illustration and there with a delightful man, Feroz Paswan, whose son is an artist and he is a professional toddy uh, palm harvester. Um, it's a fermented drink and it's very potent the longer you let it stand and it should be consumed within, I think, 48 hours probably the, the last. It's um, uh, very tasty, but it, it's, uh, should be, it's a much contested thing. However idyllic these, these scenes are, here's one where you've got uh, the toddy palm harvester climbing the toddy palm. Um, it's often very celebratory the way this has been depicted. Uh, here's a work that um, uh, belongs to Catherine Myers uh, and the artist herself. Um, alcohol is a big issue in the state of Bihar. And in the Floyd Gallery, in the left, towards the end of the left wall, you will see a painting by an artist that celebrates prohibition. And it's because uh, there has been so much abuse and spending that uh, from the menfolk uh, and, and uh, physical abuse and, and alcoholism that the, the women uh, found uh, unanimity and great pressure to uh, get the laws changed. And uh, so prohibition has been applied throughout the state of Bihar, uh, much to the relief of many women, but not so much to the lower caste because distilled alcohol, which benefits... Uh, uh, manufacturing, major manufacturers, um, it, uh, that's very toxic and something people can't handle very well and is expensive. But the toddy palm uh, booze, hooch, whatever, that is more affordable and um, it's a whole lifestyle thing and a source of great joy for the community of the Dulwood. So they have been given us an exemption from that but they still suffer from a lot of um, 
um, pushback from the, up, uh, from the government sources. Um, this is a painting that's at Princeton's uh, Firestone Library, and we wanted to borrow this painting uh, for this exhibition here because it depicts COVID and uh, in the village and how people were experiencing it. Now, it looks like a common village scene, um, but if you were to look closely, you would see many of them wearing masks. Um, and uh, we were keen to include some kind of contemporary subject matter here. And we made it, I say we, it was Steve Arbery and I, made a pitch to uh, Princeton's uh, Firestone Library. And they were very gracious, they thought. They assured us there was no fee for lending, but that uh, they would have, we would have to underwrite a, uh, one of their staff to courier the piece down and then retrieve it. And so Steve said, let's just get another picture, commission it. And he said this right on speakerphone, and they heard it, and that's what he did, though. And this is the picture that is now in the uh, Mithla Medley exhibition next door. Uh, if you see it, you will see um, uh, to the right a very long extended label that describes every detail in this picture about the ordeals that um, were encountered, not just low by the local villagers, but also um, you'll see in the upper left corner an air airplane, and these are people arriving from overseas, getting tested and whatnot. Um, so this this artist um, has really been uh, he himself has felt compelled to go overseas. He now works in Muscat um, and has thus been separated ever since COVID hit the world um, and hasn't seen his family of three children and a lovely wife for th over three years now. Um, but he continues to work on his traditional art um, even after hours in, in a dormitory-like setting um, where uh, all of his buddies are playing cards and having a good time. He's doing these pictures. He considers them a kind of... Uh, act of devotion and yoga of sorts and there is indeed uh, quite a tradition of looking at the pursuit of arts as a form of yoga um, and uh, meditation and whatnot. Uh, this picture uh, reminds us all of the posters I trust you've all seen. Here's the artist herself uh, holding the image um, and uh, it's to alert you all that there are other exhibitions that are related to what's both here at Floyd Center for the Arts and at uh, Radford. And I just want to mention a few things about these other exhibitions. Here's Martine Lacause, uh, an artist who's in, based in France, is French, writes in French, is mostly known for her writings, not for her art. Um, and she writes both fiction and non-fiction. She was inducted into the Legion of Honor uh, there in France about, I think that was about six, seven years ago. Um, not many people there even know that she's an illustrator. And so her illustrations have been uh, at Radford uh, for the past, since uh, about a month and a half now, and it's the first public exhibition of her original illustrations, which have only occasionally appeared in her books. And why we're including her in these, this constellation of Mithla exhibitions is because of her many books. The four latest ones have a Mithla focus, and uh, two of the four focus particularly on uh, the Dalits and their hero, Raja Selesh, who is called the King of the Mountain. So. Uh, I would encourage you all to see that exhibition, partly because it relates, um, it serves as a kind of conceptual and aesthetic bridge from our cultures and normal aesthetic conventions and whatnot to theirs, in as much as, say, uh, early Cubists served the purpose of uh, sensitizing the rest of the world to the fact that Africans are capable of creating great art. Uh, none of the concepts of art simply were not applied to Africans before the Cubists uh, were so inspired and uh, excited by them. So we, in like vein, we want to show um, 
uh, Ermila Davies work uh, here on the right and I'm sorry the face of the lady seems so faded out but you can see it in the original at Radford um, and this is a painting a portrait of Ormila Davy um, juxtaposed on to the right of what is on the left uh, a depiction from uh, the, uh, from Jitwarpur that Ormila herself did and it shows Raja Salesh being born in the womb of a Dalit woman. And this was a rather radical concept that kind of crops up, but it took Martine uh, Lacause by surprise, and it inspired her to write her uh, novel, which is a fictionalized version or a retelling, one should say, of the Raja Salesh uh, tales. Um, these are kind of, uh, this is all kind of new territory for a lot of us, um, including experts who really are investigating it all for the first time. Um, a lot has been studied about the upper caste rituals and myths and whatnot. Very little about the festivals, rituals of the Dalits. And um, so the iconography as well. And uh, we have uh, Radford University is putting out uh, a um, catalog, an e-book catalog, which is being co-edited by Steve Arbery and myself and beautifully designed by Jennifer Spoon. And it will be uh, many pages long and including a number of uh, articles by leading scholars from University of Chicago, Berkeley, uh, and Martine Lacause herself has an essay in it. Uh, and it will be, a, we hope, a milestone in the study of these arts and uh, spur others to do more research in the area. Um, here's a picture, again, you remember seeing uh, Abhilasha Kumari, the 14-year-old the who did that puzzle picture. Well, this is another picture, of, a portrait of her at a younger age by Martine Lacause, juxtaposed with another one of um, of Abhilasha's lovely fish paintings, in this case a fish a tank in the center of a village surrounded by auspicious peacocks and a tree of life. Um, she's, many of the artists that are Dalit are kind of shy about using bold colors. She wasn't, so it's not just black and white. She, she loves to work in bold colors. Another exhibition uh, recently closed in Blacksburg at the Milleroff Main Street Gallery, and that was a solo exhibition of this artist, um, uh, Naresh Paswan. And he is the same artist who did the COVID picture we just saw a, a moment ago. And we wanted to have that extra exhibition for various reasons. So often, these artists are only presented in a kind of club together way indicating that they're kind of ethnographic phenomenon and whatnot. We felt it important to at least have highlight one artist and show him or her, in this case him, uh, with all the dignity accorded to any Western artist in our own community as an individual capable of um, doing uniquely wonderful work. And this is a picture we borrowed from Pankaj Mishra in London. The picture, it's hard, it's kind of faded out with the, uh, uh, but here are the, more of the details. It's the uh, Hindu monkey god Hanuman, who in the Ramayana uh, epic uh, encounters, let me go back a bit, encounters a great demoness in the waters between India and Sri Lanka, and she emerges and she, she has this um, power that anything that comes into her mouth is doomed and she will eat it and he plays tricks on her in order to uh, uh, evo ev evade that uh, fate. And it's quite a, a long and amusing story, but um, what I want to maybe focus on is the liveliness of um, these figures here, uh, these fish, the richness of these borders. Um, it's done with great finesse, and frankly, uh, I'm kind of acquainted with depictions from the Ramayana and the Mahabharat uh, from uh, throughout India at various eras, and I think uh, Naresh can hold his own compared to anything. 
So uh, I am delighted in that. He also has done this wonderful triptych arrangement that's on display at uh, Radford. And there are 16 small panels uh, flanking a central one. The small 16 panels um, uh, all depict uh, various rituals that have to do with uh, a bhagat, a, a shaman priest of the Dalit community being possessed uh, by the deity and healing various people. And in the center, you have uh, Raja Selesh himself on a, mounted um, on an elephant, and that's his mahout, the elephant driver before him. And his whole entourage is surrounding him. And really, it's in staggering detail. I'm sorry, these uh, slide images don't do it justice, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's really, it, to my mind, uh, flies in the face of so much prejudice. How to say this? I think you all know the word oxymoron. Um, and to couple the two words, art, Dalit and art is for most um, Hindus an utter oxymoron. These people are not capable of culture, much less art. This is the thought. And so uh, I don't argue that directly when I'm with them. I usually have my computer with me and I whip it out and I show them imagery and I start gushing. I just think that's what they need to hear sometimes. So this is another artist who does these wonderful trees of life. Um, this one in the center of two shrines. Um, and she spawned a whole movement of these trees of life, each of which are, have a wonderful kind of a rhythm and different qualities of, of um, some like shattered glass or ice, others a little more voluptuous, um, some tinted with color, others not. Um, and uh, it just bleeds off into all kinds, like jazz, modern jazz. You take a theme and you just improvise on it. And in this case, this tree is just filled with little dots that are all sheer abstractions, all depicting uh, a flock of auspicious kachbachia birds, which are the jungle babbler, um, that uh, are very cherished there. They're chatterbox birds, chatterbox birds. and. Uh, so uh, this is a, a delightful theme. Um, I, uh, again, uh, what, there are liabilities for doing something eye-catching. In this case, this particular picture was, uh, was spotted by a, um, a uh, Japanese hotelier who was building many hotels, and he decided that he wanted to um, commission about hundreds of these. And so the artist who made this kind of gets reduced to becoming a factory. And he uh, you know, subcontracts with his neighbors, and they produce, and he signs. And uh, this kind of mode is inevitable if things are priced the way they are, and uh, the desperate need for income is as it is still. Um, this is a, another work by uh, Rajesh, uh, by Naresh. Paswan, and this is showing insects in the garden of Raja Celeste. Indeed, completely abstract in the center. Um, so it's fascinating to see the range of these works um, and uh, a real delight to just enjoy the variety of it. This is a particularly whimsical work with um, fish interlocked in a tree by, um, and two peacocks to either side. Um, and these jazzy palm fronds coming in from the side. They were identified as such by the artist, kind of looking art deco-like. Uh, deco um, so this is, this is um, where we are. I'm not sure. I think you, I don't want to overwhelm you all with um, too much in, uh, imagery and whatnot. And I don't know what the time is getting either for that matter. Not, no, oh well, I think I've been speaking quite a bit and I thank you all for being such a nice audience. It's nice to see you all and, and, and of course there are questions or what Thank you. Good. Good. Are there any questions or?
you're all troopers. I know you all each, and <laughs> you've shown up, and this is very gratifying. And I, I think by the by the time uh, uh, you've heard this uh, now tonight, you can all give your own Mitla lecture. <laughs> you've shown up so often, so I I, I thank I you. Wish. Yes. Well, it's. Uh, hey, I I'm curious about why the reluctance to recognize Dalit art, even in the Englishman who in 1934 discovered them, he went for the, uh, you know, for the upper class art, but not for, I guess, the middle or lower class, the Dalit art, you know, and it, could he even distinguish them? I mean, I guess he would know. He, but, yeah, it's... But, why not take all the photos? Yeah. yeah. I, that, that mystifies me. I guess like anybody from the West, you know, the whole Indian caste system is completely mystifying anyway. But um, that, that, is, that is my, you know, big question is, you know, they seem so rich and so obviously are, you know, um, well composed and artistic in nature that anybody who would deny that just seems like, you know, in the category of an election denier or a climate denier or something like that. Um, do they not? Uh, so is that prejudice now breaking down, I guess, is the question. It's actually um, uh, yes and no, because in certain circles that are, you would call it progressive circles, the recognition of the Dulits having a separate style and also celebrating their unique themes, particularly Raja Selesh and a few others. Um, it's becoming more recognized. There are issues that uh, keep cropping up, usually at the lower ends of the journalists' uh, circles that have, frankly, kind of political agendas that um, do not want the Dulits getting too much separate recognition. They would like to think or they are posing that um, the category is um, foisted on their arts and that it's really more just integrated or lesser quality um, of the high caste. Uh, there are different ways they package that, but they, they say for some of them that this focus on um, Selesh, uh, Raja Selesh, it would be kind of uh, foisted on them as a market ploy uh, or uh, a result of uh, foreigners in search of something exotic and new and novel and um, and uh, there are very specific reasons why one can push back at that. Mm -hmm. Fortunately that kind of discussion hasn't reached yet the upper levels of discourse academically so it's easy kind of to ignore it. The problem is that when journalists say these things if you start engaging with them in a serious way, it almost exalts that, it uh, raises that to a... When you a, say journalists, you mean Indian journalists. Indian journalists, yeah. yeah. Um, Americans are, you know, people are clueless about these arts. Even yeah. in India, they don't know that this exists. And as, as I think you all have heard from me repeatedly, that these arts, uh, this is the first international exhibition of a group show of Dalit art. Um, that's ever been done, and it's just astonishing. We're talking about millions of people, um, and so uh, I I'm feel amazed that I have the privilege of doing it. It's here in Virginia, um, and it's not in a major metropolitan U.S. center, but I think our catalog will reach out to many people, and the very word that we've done, a, a comprehensive approach here with involving four different venues, gallery venues and uh, symposium and all the rest. And I just am so grateful uh, to have that opportunity. I couldn't uh, presume to do that elsewhere. Um, I, the first exhibition of Indian art I was ever involved with and uh, I was hired briefly by the Philadelphia Museum of Art to help the final arrangements for an exhibition called Manifestations of Shiva. And that was done in 1981, and it was 10 years in the planning. And one of the exciting aspects of that, that program, and what inspired me to be kind of ambitious with a multi-venue approach here, was that 
for that big exhibit, and it was major. I mean, the Prime Minister and Indira Gandhi was a close friend of the curator, uh, Stella Cramrich, and there was even talk of Prime Minister Gandhi coming to the US for that exhibition, specifically. Um, it didn't happen in the end, but there was sure a lot of high-level support um, for this, and not just for the museum there. The uh, Philadelphia Zoo had highlighted the animals of India. The uh, uh, Freer Library there did manuscripts of India with illuminated manuscripts and had special reading times for the children, of the stories of India, folklore of India. Um, the uh, Franklin Institute had a big display of kites. Who knew that they could connect you know, one of the iconic images of, of uh, Benjamin Franklin with what few people know is an Indian invention, the kite. Um, so in this vein, the town, it was a t citywide celebration of India. And I just thought, this is so beautiful and, and so complimentary. And it was really so easy in a way, because all of them had resources. that They just needed to get in sync with one another. And that's what I think we've tried to do here now. Um, and Floyd's Center for the Arts has done educational outreach. You can go downstairs and see uh, 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 large drawings of the town of Floyd, but in emulation of the, uh, uh, not the Dulwich style, but the, the more meticulous Brahmin style, but showing Red Rooster and the library and the Floyd Center for the Arts, all of them depicted it with loving detail. And I gather it was Victoria Javier who did that with the school, uh, school groups uh, locally. And, uh, and this is just wonderful. There have been likewise uh, initiatives at Radford um, with the Sprigs of the Tree group that came in a, uh, over two dozen uh, high school art teachers assembled just this last Monday at Radford. Uh, we toured in the morning both of the exhibitions, Martine Lacaze and Roger Selesh, and spent all of the afternoon doing marvelous works. Let me see if I can find these just to show you an example of these. Um, how does this all disappear? Um, well, that's interesting. Any event, I have here and I can send to you by. Oh, here we go. Um, this is what happened, I wonder. Uh, with uh, the group, here we're in the gallery in the morning, speak, talking about the original art. But then later in the afternoon, Nikki Pin had this wonderful lesson plan she put together with uh, a drawing uh, of a bold tree of life with the kind of border design that people made a shortcut with styrofoam printing it over and over and then these lovely tree images inside. Um, this one only is uh, the example from the exhibit. All the rest are done by local teachers. And I say uh, local art teachers. Some people were coming all the way. Three teachers came all the way from Pat Patrick County waking up to, at 5.30 a.m. in order to join us that day. That was the level of enthusiasm. And this is not the first time R uh, RU has done this, organized this. Uh, it's, uh, and so we hope to plan to keep doing these exhibits uh, that are tied into uh, art education workshops. And so you know, between Radford and Floyd's initiatives uh, to do community outreach and um, educational projects, it's kind of really exciting. Um, I think we're just beginning to do it. Uh, and pe people have been pretty hard hit with lack of resources and post-COVID and getting momentum back, but it's happening. It's happening. Good. Well, thank you all. <laughs>